So I find words I never thought to speak, in streets I never thought I should revisit, when I left my body on a distant shore. T.S. Eliot. Welcome to Montreal Street Signs. This is St. Paul, Montreal's first paved street. In 1672, two kilometers of cobblestones were laid from Barry to Montfort. Walk with me. At the time, the entire population of Montreal was 625 citizens, and most of them lived right along this very cobblestone road. Imagine, for 150 years, citizens made their way through the dark, holding candles and torchlights. Then, in 1816, Montreal granted St. Paul its very first street lamps. They were installed on the West End, in front of the more popular shops, because they cost $7 a piece. Within the year, street lights began rolling up the hill like a rising sun, starting with Notre Dame Street and then beyond. I bet you even have street lights on your street now. This first attempt at turning night into day was fueled by whale oil, the most popular choice in the world at the time for street lamps, a fact that almost drove whales to extinction. It took until 1837 before the Montreal Gas Company installed street lights that burned coal gas. These were the flickering lamps made famous in the dark, shadowy films of Jack the Ripper and Sherlock Holmes, with their tiny smoking chimneys and eerie shadows cast on stone-gray buildings, prone to blow out in the slightest breeze. Keep in mind, there was no single switch that activated city lights like we have today. A lamplighter would have to scale each gas lamp at sunset, then extinguish it around 10 p.m. Good luck getting home after midnight. Fifty years later, a young American named Thomas Edison pitched his invention so convincingly, the Royal Electric Company replaced all the gas lamps in Montreal with electric ones. Suddenly, one universal switch could light entire neighborhoods, and there was no turning back. It was 1886, the year city lights replaced moonlight in Montreal. Another one of those stories you have to love about our city. In 1842, Charles Dickens came to Montreal and stayed at that hotel right over there, the Hotel Rasco. At that time, there were 44,000 citizens in Montreal. Most of them were English. That included the British Brigade, stationed here to keep the Americans from crossing the St. Lawrence River. You see, at that time, we had some military problems with our friends from the South, but we'll deal with that in a later episode. Troop morale was not good. The men were far from home and loved ones, unpopular with the French locals and dug into an inhospitable climate. The political leaders and top brass were always on the lookout for remembrances of England to cheer them up. So when Canadian Governor General Sir Richard Downes Jackson learned that the world-famous novelist Charles Dickens was coming, he decided to treat him like a visiting dignitary. This meant seating him at the best tables among the most important people of the time. But Dickens had other ideas. He ruffled the English aristocracy by staging a French play and spending most of his time with the French locals. In fact, it was with them he experienced and was very moved by strongly held traditions of holidays spent with family and friends, long forgotten in England. It took Charles Dickens six weeks to write his most famous novel, A Christmas Carol. We all know it's the template describing better than any other novel ever the true meaning of Christmas. What you might not know is the novel was published in 1843, less than one year after his emotional visit to this city filled with its holiday traditions of Christmas. Am I saying I think 
this city influenced one of the greatest novels of all time? Yeah, I am. St. Paul is one of over 60 streets named after saints by Dolier de Cannon. The purpose was to funnel parishioners towards the magnificent Notre Dame Cathedral. <clears throat> Actually, most of these streets weren't named after saints at all. Uh-oh, it's my grade school teacher, Miss Cayley. Pay attention. De Canon actually named these streets after wealthy landowners. For instance, St. Paul honored Montreal's first governor, Paul Chamedy de Maisonneuve. St. Hélène was named after the wife of explorer Samuel de Champlain. Paul, Hélène, not saints? By the way, Montreal has replaced St. Hélène streetlights with its original gas lamps. Now, at night, the street looks exactly as it did 200 years ago. She looks exactly the way she used to as well. How weird is that? Canada, Quebec, and even Montreal identify certain buildings as heritage sites. But some of the most famous in the whole city are right here on St. Paul. The Notre Dame de Bon Secours Chapel, for instance, Montreal's first permanent church, came to be due to the blood, sweat, and tears of the remarkable Marguerite Bourgeois, a committed educator whose name is as important as any in the origins of her adopted city. This chapel is not the building that St. Marguerite began in 1657. That one was destroyed by fire in 1754 and not resurrected again until 1771 over the foundations of the original stone chapel. Many years after her death in 1770, Marguerite Bourgeois' remains were moved inside the church she built, where they remain today. There are gems scattered all around old Montreal, buried with those jewelry shops reduced to ash by the great fires. For those romantics who know where to look, St. Paul rewards with found treasures to this very day, from emeralds to diamonds to dancing partners. What has been preserved and maintained on St. Paul is history itself. But a little digging reveals that some modern facades are misleading. Take this trendy restaurant, for instance. The original structure, built in 1817, is long gone, of course, but it's worth mentioning because there stood the very first bank in all of Canada. Renamed the Bank of Montreal, it now has 900 branches and 7 million customers, including me. What we now call the Bon Secours Market was once the private home of Baron Charles Lemoyne. His son, Pierre, born in Montreal, went on to found the state of Louisiana. This is a little segment I call Stump the Stranger. I approach someone at random and ask them a question related to the episode they can't possibly know the answer to. Watch this. Excuse me, sir. I was wondering if you could possibly know the name of the oldest paved road in the world. Egypt's Road to Giza, first paved 4,600 years ago, and it's roughly seven and a half miles long. Uh, we're sort of doing themes here, and earlier I was discussing the Rasco Hotel, very old here in Montreal. There's no way, there's no way you could tell me the name of the oldest hotel on the planet. Nisiyama Onsam in Japan, first opened in, seven, in the year 705, and it's been run by the same family for 46 generations. We done? Yeah, we're done. Few people realize that slavery existed in this country from 1709 until the British Empire eliminated it in 1833. Until that time, it's estimated we had 2,000 slaves, a sad century. Most of them were Aboriginal peoples, but some were of African descent. Slavery has existed since the beginning of human history reaching the shores of the New World in the 1670s when the French began accepting captives from their Aboriginal partners as tokens of friendship. By the early 18th century, the practice of buying and selling prisoners was a fact of Montreal life. But of all the stories, none have captured the imagination like the tragic life of one African slave named Angelique. 
Born in Africa and swept up in the Atlantic slave trade, Angelique sailed against her will to New England at the age of 15. Soon after, she was purchased by a French businessman and brought to Montreal. Here, she fell in love with a white servant boy. The community didn't approve of the union, and after a failed attempt to escape together, legend has it the stubborn and willful Angelique exacted her revenge, setting fire to the home she lived in. It burned to the ground, as did 46 other buildings, including Montreal's only hospital. It was 1734, and the devastation brought the entire city to its knees. Justice was swift. The King of France didn't allow a printing press in the new world of that time. So without a newspaper, the facts that might have saved Angelique never reached the streets. And public rumor ruled the day. She was tortured and then hung on June 21st. You know, legend has it that St. Paul Street is the most haunted street in the most haunted city, Montreal, in Canada. Have I got that right, Mr. King? Yes, that uh, is absolutely correct. Uh, they say that this is the most haunted street in the city, if not the entire country. Now, is it because the ghosts here are scarier than elsewhere, or are there more ghosts than elsewhere? Well, this is one of the oldest streets here in the city, so the ghosts of St. Paul Street go back all the way to the New France era. Uh, so certainly there is a lot of them here on the street. They say that the street is crawling with ghosts. <laughs> uh, no offense, don't know if I'm a believer. This island has actually been inhabited for thousands upon thousands of years, probably something like eight or 10,000 years. So there's legends that go back uh, to the First Nations as well. This was a very multicultural uh, city oh, before really? the Europeans okay. arrived here, actually. So yeah, there's some legends that go back to that. Uh, there's the legends of New France. There's even a legend uh, that combines them both, a legend about a man named Jean Saint-Père. And, uh, you know, he was sort of a bloodthirsty fellow. He was there in the original colony. He was one of the first colonists. And he enjoyed nothing more than going out and killing the Iroquois people who refused to convert to Catholicism, because that was the purpose of the colony. So he was seen as sort of enemy number one by the Iroquois people. And that's why they ambushed him and they uh, basically killed him and his valet just on the banks of the St. Lawrence one afternoon. Uh, but then according to this legend, they chopped his head off and brought it back with them across the river in their canoe as some sort of a souvenir. But here's where the story gets weird. Now this was the first historian in New France. Uh, his name was Dolier de Casson. And so he writes in one of the first history books that when the Iroquois people got to the other side of the river, the head of Jean Saint-Père actually started speaking to them. And it started speaking to them in the Iroquois language, even though he had never spoken it while he was alive. And so the head began taunting them, it began informing them that this was New France now, and they were to be the servants, and the, the French were the masters, and on and on like this. And they tried everything to get rid of this head. They tried to throw it away into the forest, but it kept rolling back into the encampment. And finally, they had to basically throw it into a pot of water and boil it and, you know, peel away it, the flesh. shut up. And uh, yeah, they even wow. crushed the, the skull into powder, and they kept only the scalp. And even according to this legend, the scalp uh, began insulting them until they threw that into the bonfire, and that was the end of uh, this particular spirit. That is a wonderful story, but another story which near and dear to our heart today. How about the haunted Kalesh? Yes, the haunted Kalesh is definitely a, a very disturbing story here in the city, given the amount uh, of horse-drawn carriages we have, and given the popularity of this activity with the tourists. Uh, now, with the Phantom Kalesh, there's two versions of the story that I've heard, actually. And again, this is one of the most dangerous ghosts in the city, I believe. Oh. Now, in the first version, uh, the Kalesh will stop for some tourists, and the... Um, you know, the Kalesh driver will beckon them to come on board as the Kaleshes do, and the tourists will climb aboard the Kalesh only to have it vanish into thin air right before their eyes, leaving them quite startled, as I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> now, in the second version of the story, the tourists climb aboard the Kalesh, and then the Kalesh begins to roll away, and that's the last that we ever see of those tourists. <laughs> oh, boy. 
You know, Mr. King, you have been wonderfully entertaining. I've loved every minute of this. But I have to be honest with you. I don't believe in no ghosts. But thanks for the tour. Not all heritage sites are tourist attractions surrounded with a lot of hoopla. The Cagia Smithy here was founded at the end of the 19th century, small but eloquent evidence of Montreal's more romantic past. Closed in the 1980s, this modest three-story building was recently declared an endangered heritage site. Now it sits alone on the west end of St. Paul, a deserted relic. Its future, one might imagine, is uncertain. And now, except for the occasional movie shoot, it's completely abandoned. Let's not overstay our visit, huh? Hey, hey, hey. Where do you think you're going? We've reached the end of St. Paul. But now, you and I are heading off in another direction to another street and brand new wonders. Come on, let's go. My favorite street in Montreal is Bernard. I've just arrived here and opened the store, and I feel so welcome. Roussel uh, Saint Henri, um, because there's a hotel there, and it's just so much fun over there. Saint Laurent, because I think it characterizes Montreal fully. That's a no-brainer, Saint Theater. I love uh, Cherrier Street. My favorite street is Saint Catherine, because there are no cars in the summertime. <laughs> 